Greetings, friends. Welcome back to the broadcast. I'm Sean. Website can be found at www.scriptureandprophecy.com. That's where you go to find the archives, and that's where you go to support this mission of truth. Well, today we are resuming our study in the Gospel according to John. We're going to read chapters 2 and 3 this morning. Chapter 2 starts off and uh, gives us that very first recorded miracle of Jesus changing uh, the wine or the water into wine at the marriage party. And then chapter 2 starts off with that encounter with uh, the Pharisee Nicodemus. And even though these are common stories that we're all familiar with, and when I say common, I mean they've been, they've been told over and over and over, it's important to open up our hearts and try to listen and read it as if it was the first time and try to put yourself into the story meaning try to try to imagine the story uh, as a, as opposed to just hearing it again letting it go in one ear and out the other and there just might be something there that God will reveal to you so open up your hearts listen closely and let's have a look. The Gospel of John, chapter 2. I'm reading from the King James Version this morning. Let's begin. And the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, they have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do? What I, He said, Woman, what have I to do with thee? My hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Do whatever he saith unto you. Do it. All right, let's just pause for a second. There's a marriage happening. And it's in Cana or Cana of Galilee. So it's in an obscure place. It's nowhere really close to Jerusalem. It's kind of out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, it's very likely that these were kin to Jesus, uh, which is why his mother was already there as part of the, the getting it prepared or whatever. And then Jesus and his disciples are invited to attend Okay, that's all that's going on here. And yet, this is where we're going to see the first miracle happen. It's not in some, it's not out in front of the crowds or, you know, in Jerusalem or right in front of the religious leaders. It's, it's just in this really little obscure place amongst people that were mostly probably related or knew Jesus already, which is interesting. The other thing that I always find interesting when I read this story, first of all, in English it may seem like Jesus is being disrespectful, but that's not what's going on. He's just he's basically saying, uh, what does that have to do with us? <laughs> like, okay, they're out of wine, what does that have to do with us? My time is not yet come. And instead of having any type of back and forth, <laughs> gee, Mary just looks at the servants and just says, do whatever he says, and walks in, and that's it. It's just like, we need wine. Tells the servants, do whatever he says. I think it's just beautiful, the context in, with it, in, in which it happens, and where it happens, and how it's not in some major crowd, in some major demonstration. It's done in a more humble way. So verse 5, His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And then were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkin a spice. And Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear it. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was, 
but the servants which drew the water knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom, and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. After this he went down to Capernaum, he and his mother and his brethren and his disciples, and they continued there not many days. So please note, back to the miracle. It's telling us here this is the first one he did, but he did it in so that his disciples might believe. Right? So his disciples are following him. He does this thing, and the only people look, the governor of the wedding or of the marriage party didn't know. A majority of the people didn't know where the wine came from. Only the servants, right? The lowliest of the people that were there, and the disciples. That's all who knew what took place. And it was about their faith. That's why it says here, um, the beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee. This is how we know this is the beginning of him doing miracles because it tells us. And his disciples believed on him. And this, so that's an important thing to note. Verse 13, And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. So Passover is one of those feasts where you were commanded to sojourn. Just like tabernacles. We just discussed that a couple weeks ago. And so Jesus, who obeys the law completely and fully, otherwise he would not be worthy to be the perfect sacrifice, right? He's completely obedient to the things of God. The him and his disciples, they go up to Jerusalem for the feast. Verse 14. And found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple and the sheep of oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And he said unto them that sold doves, Take these things hence and make not my father's house a house of merchandise. We may be remembered of the scripture in the uh, prophet, the book of uh, prophet Jeremiah, chapter 7, verse 11, where he says, Is this house, which is called by my name, become a, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, even I have seen it, saith the Lord. Continuing on. So Jesus says, Take these things hence. Make not my father's house the house of merchandise. So he's literally driving out the money changers and the people that are basically making it difficult for those who need to do the sacrifices by being there selling the things. It's pro selling the animals. It's probably at a premium. Verse 17, and a scripture comes to mind to his disciples. Verse 17, and his disciples remembered that it was written, The zeal of thy house hath eaten me up. So they're seeing what he's doing, and they're probably like, oh my gosh, we're going to get in so much trouble. <laughs> you know, They're seeing him do this, and then a scripture comes to their mind, and his disciples remembered that it was written, the zeal of thy house has eaten me up. And that comes from the Psalms. So if you go to Psalm 69, verse 9, For the zeal of my house hath eaten me up, and the reproaches of men that reproacheth thee are fallen upon me. And of course, Psalm 119, verse 139, My zeal hath consumed me, because my enemies have forgotten thy words. That's a beautiful scripture within itself. Continuing on, verse 18. Then answered the Jews and said unto him, What signs showest thou unto us, seeing that thou doest these things? Jesus answered and saith unto them, Destroy this temple, and I, and in three days I will raise it up. Then said the Jews, Forty and six years was this temple in building, and wilt thou rear it up in three days? But he spake of the temple of his body. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said unto them, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had said. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover, in the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. 
But Jesus did not commit himself unto them, because he knew all men, and needed not that any should ter- testify of man, for he knew what was in man. So that's the end of chapter 2. We're going to read chapter 3 real quick here. But he starts his miracles in a kind of a more subtle and obscure way. But then he shows up in Jerusalem uh, on Passover. The most, one of the, it's going to be a very, very large crowd there. And he starts performing miracles there. And then, of course, Jesus typically isn't doing these things to impress religious people, right? He's doing them in the sight of more common people. And the religious leaders are like, what sign are you going to do for us? He says, the sign you're going to see is I'm going to tear down the temple and in three days build it back up again. They think he's obviously, which anybody listening would have thought that's what he meant. They think he's talking about the physical temple. But the disciples knew after the fact, after he rose from the dead, that he was actually talking about his body. Chapter 3, now we're going to have an encounter with Jesus with a religious leader. Not just any religious leader, but a very prominent religious leader. Nicodemus. Verse 1, there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, We know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest, doest, except God be with him. So Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews, very, very high position, Pharisee. He's one of the few that sees what's going on and has some sense about him, right? He's like, obviously, no regular person could do these things. He has to be of God. And he comes to Jesus at night because why? The other religious leaders are going to have at him if they know that he's meeting with Jesus. And he even gives Jesus the proper respect. He calls him rabbi and, and, and you know, he approaches him in that manner. But then Jesus is going to confound him, confuse him here. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, You must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but cannot tell whence it cometh, and whither it goeth. So is every one that is born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus answered and said unto him, How can these things be? And Jesus answered and said unto him, Are thou a master of Israel, and knowest not these things? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, we speak that we do know, and testify that we have seen, and yet receive not our witness. If I have told you of early earthly things, and you believe not, how shall you believe if I tell you of heavenly things? And no man hath ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man which is in heaven. And as Moses was Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but he have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whomsoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For every one that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they were wrought in God 
All right, let's take a moment here. Obviously, we have the most famous Christian passage in all the Bible as far as what people know, right? John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. We'll get to that in a second. First, he tells Nicodemus, you got to be born again. Which anybody hearing this would be a little confused, right? What do you mean, born again? You can't blame Nicodemus for saying, I don't get it. You mean, how, how can a man go back into the womb? And Jesus is like, I'm telling you of spiritual things here. Flesh, you know, brings forth flesh and cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. You have to be born of the Spirit. Paul kind of describes it like you become a new creation, right? You believe and you're transformed, okay? You become a new creature. All things have been made new, right? That's kind of that mindset, and it is hard to kind of grasp and understand. But all of us who have believed upon the name of Jesus, we've been changed over time, of course, but we've been changed and we've, been, we've become a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And Jesus is like, why are you marveling about these things? You're a teacher of all Israel, and yet you do not know these things. I feel like that could be said to many pastors today. You're teaching this huge congregation, and yet you don't know these little things. They're lost on you. And of course, we have the most famous passage, but it's usually, first of all, people don't, most Christians don't realize that this is a conversation that Jesus is having with a religious leader, Nicodemus. They know that verse, but they don't know the ones following it. Okay? So everyone hears, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son to whomsoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But then they don't hear the warnings that come afterwards about if you don't believe, you're condemned. Right? Because Jesus is the only way. It's not that he saved the whole world. It's that he, he came to save the world and those who actually believe are saved. Verse, so let me read those three verses again and then we're going to finish up here. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but to, that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed on the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation. Right? So, they're condemned if you don't believe, and then here's a good description of the condemnation. Here's what's really taking place. This is why so many don't believe. And this is the condemnation. That light is coming to the world... And men loved darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. See, this is the reason why they won't believe on Jesus or come to Jesus, because they love darkness. And they don't want to bring their darkness to the light and then have to be reproved about it. They love it. They don't want to hear that it's wrong. For everyone that doth the evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, and his deeds may be made manifest that they were wrought in God. And then we're going to end here with another ten verses, which is really the last testimony of John the Baptist, what he's going to say about Jesus, what he's going to say about the Savior, and his relationship to that. So, verse 22. Verse 22. After these things came Jesus and his disciples into the land of Judea. And there he tarried with them and baptized. And John also was baptizing in Enon near Salem, because there was much water there, and they came and were baptized. For John was not yet cast into prison. Then there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. And they came unto John and said unto him, Rabbi, 
He that was with thee beyond the Jordan, to whom thou bearest witness, behold, the same baptizeth, and all men come to him. And John answered and said, A man can receive nothing except it be given from heaven. Ye yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but that I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy, therefore, is fulfilled. He must increase, and I must decrease. He that cometh from above is above all. He that is of the earth is earthly, and speaketh of the earth. He that cometh from heaven is above all. And what hath and what he hath seen and heard, that he testifieth, and no man receiveth his testimony. He that hath received his testimony hath set to his seal that God is true. For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God. For God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. The Father loveth the Son, and hath given all things into his hand. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he believeth not on the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. So again, our chapter ends with John saying, If you don't believe, the wrath of God is upon you. This is the only way. Jesus is the only way. Thanks for listening this morning, friends. Thank you for being willing to support the podcast. Thank you for being willing to pray for me and my family. It's far beyond what I deserve. I pray you've been blessed this morning. Peace and grace be with all of you. And until next time, God bless.